everyone. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Fen Talks podcast. On today's episode, we're featuring Tim Berg. He is our firm's former managing partner and our go-to resource when it comes to the history of the firm. So today's conversation, we're focusing on the history of Fenimore. Well, the firm certainly has a long history, but before we dive into that conversation, Tim, for those individuals that haven't had the opportunity to meet you, would you mind just sharing a little bit more about your background and your area of practice? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I grew up, I was born in Wisconsin, but I grew up in Tucson and Yuma. Um, Went to law school at the University of Arizona and then clerked for the chief judge on the Ninth Circuit, Richard Chambers, for a year out of law school. In September, on September 15th, 1976, to be exact, um, I started working at Fenimore Craig, having completed my clerkship, and I have been there um, ever since. And so that no one has to do the math themselves, that means I've been with the firm for 45 years. My practice is primarily civil appeals and um, what I would call administrative law, public records law, public utility law, um, various kinds of um, public law issues. Um, I do some trial court work where the issue is a public law issue and it's largely a motion practice, but I'm not a jury trial lawyer. We have a lot of great people who do that and I'm not one of them. Uh, But I've been with the firm for for 45 years and have worked predominantly, I guess, on the advocacy rather than the transactional side of the firm. Well, Tim, I know you mentioned that you've been with the firm for 45 years, and that doesn't date all the way back to 1885, but you've been able to help us to keep track and pay tribute to the history of the firm and continue to tell the story about how we've evolved into the firm that we are today. So for those that didn't know, 1885, wow, the world, the state of Arizona, which is where we were originally founded, uh, looked a lot different back then. So based on the conversations that you've had, would you mind just explaining how Fenimore came to be back in the late 1800s? Sure. Um, There were two lawyers from Ohio who went to law school, I believe, at the University of Toledo, but at at a law school in Ohio and decided, as many people did in the 19th century, to go west and build their fortune. And these two men were were Louis Louis Chalmers and Richard Sloan. And they actually went to California first and didn't find any opportunities there. And someone suggested to them that there was this territory called Arizona, because we weren't a state yet, and that there would be opportunities there. And so they decided, based on this advice, to go practice law in Phoenix, Arizona. And Sloan was the first one who got there. And he wrote a book later called Memoirs of an Arizona Judge, um, in which he described arriving. The train in those days didn't come to Phoenix itself. It stopped at a town called Maricopa. And Sloan describes his arrival to begin practicing law, saying the train stopped in Maricopa, saying all, you know, all out for Phoenix. He was the only one that got out. He took a look around and the place was so desolate and empty that if the train hadn't already pulled away, he probably would have gotten back on it. So what he did then was go down to Phoenix and find a place to have an office. And he and Chalmers really um, practiced in 1885 at a firm called Sloan and Chalmers. Uh, Sloan, for reasons that aren't clear from his book, decided at some point fairly soon after the with say what about a year or so after the firm was started to go back into public service. And I'll tell you a little bit about his public service in a minute. But after Sloan and Chalmers, Lewis Chalmers, who is the person to whom we trace back our history all the way through, uh, continued to practice really without interruption with different groups until his death in 1934. Um, In 1885, Chalmers joined a firm called Tweed and Hancock and practiced there for a while. Sloan, meanwhile, went on to be the district attorney in Florence, Arizona, which is now in Gila County. It may not have been in Gila County then. He was a member of the Arizona legislature. He was a territorial Supreme Court justice. He was the last territorial governor of Arizona. And in in fact, the proclamation affirming statehood is from him is on exhibit at the state capitol if you get out to the state historical museum. Um, following following statehood, when there weren't any territorial jobs to have anymore, Sloan became a United States District Court judge. And so Sloan, after really 
founding the firm went on to have a career largely in important public service in the state. And I think he either ran for governor or thought about running for governor at one time, but never became a governor of Arizona. Between about 1886 and 1912, Chalmers practiced in combination with a number of attorneys. If I take you through this whole uh, line of things, it's way too detailed for, for our purposes. But in, in 1912, Chalmers um, joined with a fellow named Kent, who was famous for writing the Kent Decree, which controls much of the water law in Arizona even now. And Chalmers and Kent practiced together until about 1917. In 1917, Harry Fenimore, joined Chalmers' firm. This is the Fenimore that the, the name, firm's name, Fenimore name comes from. And Harry was a distinguished attorney and came down, the, the story is true or not, um, that Harry came down with a satchel full of money as an, an attorney for the Mount States Telephone and Telegraph Company. And he went around and bought up some, but not all of the telephone companies in Arizona so that they would have a majority of the market, but they couldn't be accused of monopolizing it. And we continue to represent the successors of the Mountain States Telephone and Telegraph Company to this day. Um, the successor is now Lumen, which is headquartered in Louisiana, but we've represented the local, the local Bell operating phone company um, since 1917 when, when Harry Fenton came down here. I'd love to hear some of these stories about some of our, our clients from back then and how it's carried through all these years and how we continue to serve and support them, especially on the on the water law that continues to be on one of our main water law groups. on other things. There's another long term client I'll mention later in this discussion. Um, Harry Fenimore was credited with drafting Arizona's first workman's compensation law, first sales tax act and countless other statutes, versions of which are still in effect today. Chalmers and Fenimore and a number of other people continued to practice law. Um, the next significant event really in the firm history is in 1927, when Henry Allen and Jubal Early Craig joined the firm. Craig is the, is the Craig and Fenimore Craig, which is our official name. Uh, both of them, Jubal Early Craig, as you may guess from his name, was from Virginia originally. And Jubal was named after a Confederate general, Jubal Early. And there's a story that Cal Udall, I believe, used to tell that when um, Jubal took his bar exam, in those days you did it orally in Virginia. And the last question they told him was write out a handwritten certificate of admission for these for your, you to practice law in the state of Virginia. And if you do it correctly, we'll sign it and you pass the test. And so Jubal practiced in both Virginia and in California in the Bay Area before coming here. Um, Henry Allen actually started out as a clerk in the firm. Uh, back in those days, what we now call LAAs were called clerks, and they were largely male. They were female, which uh, is different than it is today. And he eventually kind of worked, he, he read law in the office and became a lawyer. Um, sorry. In 1936, the firm's name was changed. Well, what happened is in 1934, Mr. Chalmers died. He had a son who was practicing law outside in, on his own outside the firm. And so Chalmers' widow asked Fenimore Craig and the lawyers of the firm to, to take the Chalmers name out of the firm so that her son, as I think it was Will Chalmers, but I could be wrong about that, wouldn't have to compete with a Chalmers law firm. And so at that point, which is about 1936, the firm's name became Fenimore Craig Allen and Bledsoe. Uh, the Fenimore were Fenimore, were Harry Fenimore, Jubal Early Craig, Henry Allen, and I believe Virgil Bledsoe. Uh, sorry. From 1936 to 1950, the firm really didn't change very much. People came and went. Um, a fellow, uh, we add, uh, during that time period, we added the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway as a client. We still continue to represent. Um, the successor of that railway, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, um, in land-related matters and in uh, some of its subsidiaries in mineral and land matters. The, the, in 1927, I'm going to go back a little bit, um, Harry Fenimore's oldest son, Richard, joined the firm. And he practiced with the firm until he retired in 1967. His youngest son, John, joined the firm in 1939, but passed away in about 1948. Jubal Craig's son, Walter, joined the firm in 1934. 
And Walter is probably, um, up until we get to the part later when I talk about John O'Connor, Walter was probably the most nationally prominent lawyer that Fenimore Craig ever had. Um, he was president of the county bar, president of the state bar. He was president of the American Bar Association, I think one of two or three that Arizona has ever had. He was named as the chief counsel to the Warren Commission, which investigated the John F. Kennedy assassination. And after the assassination and after the Warren Commission wrapped up its work, um, Judge Craig was appointed to the uh, United States District Court. And when I began practicing in 1976, Judge Craig was the chief judge of the United States District Court, and Philip Von Allman, who was then the senior partner in the firm, walked me down to federal court and had Judge Craig swear me in. So I was sworn in by two longtime partners of the Fenimore Craig Law Firm when I began practicing. Um, Robert Allen, Henry's son, became uh, was a lawyer with the firm from 1950 to 1952. I think the message you get is that in the, from about the mid 30s to the early 50s, this was a family business. It was the Fenimores, the Craigs, and the Allens, and, and some other people, Virgil Bledsoe, and some other folks. In 1951, 1952, and 1955, Calvin Udall, Philip Von Amen, and Louis McClendon joined the firm. And these folks really were the ones who began running the firm in the 50s and ran it. Um, some of them were still running it when I came in the, in the 70s. But in the 50s and in from, say, about 1955 to 1970, the firm really started to grow. Um, we had, a, just as a statistic, from 1955 to 1970, we grew to a firm of 22 lawyers, which was huge in Phoenix at that time. The original firm, there's a picture that used to hang in the firm office, and I think it's in storage somewhere that shows the firm when Mr. Chalmers was still here, and it was like five lawyers, all of whom are uh, white men in white buck shoes, which is gives you the old white shoe law firm look at the place. We added a number of lawyers in the, in the 50s and 60s, the most uh, important of whom I'll talk for, about later is John O'Connor III. John O'Connor III was a son of a doctor in San Francisco and went to Stanford Law School, where he married a woman who was a year ahead of him in law school. I think actually they got married after they got out of law school, but her name is Sandra Day O'Connor, and you may have heard of, heard of her, but John was uh, was a prominent business lawyer with the firm. He did some corporate work. He did some litigation. Um, John seemed to know everybody in town. You would go to lunch with John O'Connor and you'd walk in the front door of whatever restaurant you were in and it took you a half an hour to get to your table because John had to stop at every table on the way to your table to talk to somebody he knew. My most vivid recollection of John in some ways um, was that he represented, I think, every car dealer in town. I never understood why everybody hired the same lawyer to represent them, but they all did. Uh, it used to be great if you wanted to go get a car, you go to one of John's clients and you know, get a, maybe a deal, maybe not, but at least you got treated pretty well. Moving forward um, to the early 70s, the firm continued to grow. In 1974, we hired our first two female lawyers, Ruth McGregor and Tony McClory. Um, Ruth is, a, is an important figure in the, in the history of the firm for, for a number of reasons. One, um, she became our first female shareholder director, which is the equivalent of partner. Um, while she was a shareholder in the firm in 1980, in 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed to the United States Supreme Court. And in late 1981 or early 1982, I can't remember when exactly Sandra wound up things and actually started working. Ruth, who was a, at that time a shareholder and director in the firm, took a year-long leave of absence to be Sandra O'Connor's first law clerk. And so Sandra had a law clerk who was a, by then probably a 10 or 12, year, 10 or 15 year lawyer, plus two law students. So I suspect I know who ran uh, the office beside Sandra in those days. But Ruth spent a year clerking for Sandra. She came back and worked with us for a while and was in those days, we had labor and employment kind of divided in two groups. Labor was Don Gilbert and employment was, uh, was Ruth McGregor. Ruth at some point decided she wanted to be a judge. So she was appointed to the Arizona Court of Appeals, then to the Arizona Supreme Court and retired after serving a term as the Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court. Tony McClory stayed with the firm less time, I think a couple, three years, then went to work at the Arizona Attorney General's office and was a valued lawyer there um, in her day. When I joined the firm in September of 1976, 
The firm's name was Fenimore, Craig Von Amman, and Udall. In addition to Phil Von Amman and Cal Udall, who were the two named senior partners in the firm, John O'Connor, Tom Wiley, and Kent Blake were among the senior partners in the firm. Uh, Kent was a business lawyer, one of the nicest men you'll ever meet. Uh, just a gracious, gracious, pleasant man. John, I told you about a little bit before, but I worked a lot with John when I started, and he was one of these people who was a great teacher. You could learn a lot about being a good, organized, efficient lawyer just by doing what John O'Connor did. Tom Wiley was a genius um, tax and estate planning lawyer. I tell you that because people have told me I don't know enough about estate planning and tax to know who was a genius or not. But Wiley was widely respected throughout the, the state and, and the bar. In 1981 and 82, two things happened that really changed the firm. Well, three things happened that changed the firm significantly. One, Sandra O'Connor got appointed to the US Supreme Court and John, um, who I think people viewed as the heir apparent to Phil Von Amman as the managing partner of the firm left and went to Washington. And we didn't have a Washington office, so we left the firm and went to work at a Washington law firm. Then Tom Wiley, the senior tax and estate planning lawyer also decided to leave. Tom had a number of interests beside being a lawyer. He's one of these, rena people use the term Renaissance man. Tom was one of those. He actually, um, one of the things he did when he retired was he went hiking in Nepal, for example. But Tom retired and relocated to Santa Fe in the end. And so at that point, we had lost um, a couple of really important senior lawyers. But particularly with Tom's departure, we had lost our estate planning, our chief estate planning lawyer and our chief tax lawyer. So we went out and looked for people to join the firm. At this point, I had been a partner all of three months, so I won't tell you I was intimately involved in this process, but I was aware it was going on. And what we did in 1982 or three was we merged with a firm called Powers, Ehrenreich, Bautel, and Kern. Um, that firm had originally started out as a firm called Powers and Rehnquist. Uh, Jim Powers and a guy named Bill Rehnquist, who also ended up being on the US Supreme Court, um, practiced together for a while. And then when uh, Justice or Chief Justice Rehnquist left first to work in the Justice Department for Nixon and then to be on the US Supreme Court, Powers had a series of firms. Jim Powers was one of these people who was um, truly uh, the Arizona tax, federal, federal tax lawyer. Um, clients would hire Jim to, to, um, to do that work. We, Jim brought with him a number of lawyers who really strengthened the firm. Um, in 1880, at that point, the firm's name was Fenimore, Craig, Von Amman, Udall, and Powers. At, at, in 1987, we short, short, shortened it, pardon me, to Fenimore, to Fenimore Craig. In 1989, we opened our Tucson office. Um, that office grew significantly. Oops, trying to keep my timeline in front of me. In 1999, when we added a group of O'Connor, of lawyers from the firm of O'Connor Cavanaugh, which was dissolving, they recommended that we talked to the two lawyers, Hector and Kim Arana, in their Nogales office. And I remember I was on the management committee then, and we had a question, why Nogales? Went down and talked to Kim and Hector, discovered if they were great people, it would be a great opportunity. And that's really how the firm started its cross-border practice. Um, as the century turned, Fenimore Craig was a leading Arizona law firm with offices in Phoenix, Tucson, and Nogales. We then undertook a strategic planning process and began to look outside Arizona. And in September of 2006, we opened our first office outside Arizona. And that was in Las Vegas with two lawyers from the firm of Morris and Mowbray. In December of the same year, which is not how you do strategic planning, but how it happened, we opened the Denver office by adding two lawyers from the Dahl law firm up there who did IP work. We continued to concentrate on expanding the firm both inside and outside Arizona. In July of 2012, we added 25 lawyers from the well-respected Nevada Jones of Argus firm, both to our Las Vegas office and ended up opening a Reno office as part of that process. Um, Ann Morgan, who today is, is still in the Reno office and is president of the uh, Nevada State Bar, was the original sort of head of the Reno office um, and started that office off. In 2015, we added 19 lawyers from Lionel Sawyer firm in um, in both Las Vegas and Reno, strengthening both of those offices. In November of 2020, we joined forces with the California firm of Dowling Aaron, giving the combined firm now known as Fenimore offices, additional offices in Fresno, Bakersfield, and Sacramento. 
Um, we were in California for the first time. We had looked at doing that for quite a long time and finally moved over there when we found the right people. Um, in April of 2021, just this year, we added lawyers from the well-respected Denver firm of Riley LLP to the firm's Denver office. Um, the firm continues to grow and prosper by adding additional lawyers and looking at different opportunities, um, primarily in the West, although we have looked at opportunities elsewhere over time. Uh, I've talked an awful long time. Would you like to, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You know, I think the firm's history is really important, especially for all of our new team members to hear kind of what's happened throughout the year. So Tim, really appreciate you sharing how the firm has withstood over the last 136 years through two world wars, the Great Depression, the Great Recession, and now a worldwide global pandemic. Um, but I do think the themes that I've heard in today's conversation is just the fact that we continue to recruit top talent and great people and think of a high growth mindset. That's really what's helped our firm to evolve throughout the years. So would like to get your um, personal takeaways based on everything that you've seen throughout the firm history and kind of, you know, what the, what our future looks like. Is there anything else that you'd like to note there? I, I think two things. One, first, I'd like to tell you what I think is special about the firm and then tell you why, what I think about our growth rate. To me, the, the firm is the people. What makes this firm special are the really wonderful people we have who work here. Um, everyone, the, the lawyers, the LAAs, the legal assistants, the administrative staff, the, the C-suite team. Um, it's a great group of people to work with. I think all of us have had opportunities to go elsewhere, usually for more money at different times. And people have stayed at Fenimore Craig. I'm, been here 45 years and so is Larry Castor. We practice law together forever. And one of the reasons we're both here is the firm is so wonderful and the people. The second thing I think is, is important about the firm is something Phil Von Amen noted back in the 1980s when he gave a talk like this. And that is, we, do, we practice law the right way. We do high quality work, even sometimes when you can't charge for all the high quality work we do, but we, we're incredibly proud of our work product. Two, we practice law the right way. We don't push up through sharp elbows. We, we don't file bar complaints. We don't file frivolous sanction motions. Um, we don't do what the client wants us to do if they shouldn't. There's a great old saying that half the business of any decent lawyer is telling would-be clients are damn fools and should stop. And I think we're more willing to do that sometimes than other law firms are. Uh, I think that's part of what makes us special. And we're lawyers' lawyers. We get hired by other law firms to represent them in part because of that reputation. I think the other thing, one of the things I've seen since 1976, particularly in Arizona, because I've practiced here that long, is that you need to continue to grow and evolve. When I came to town, there were probably seven or eight large business law firms. Fenimore Craig was one of them. Probably four of those, five of those firms are still in existence. A lot of them have disappeared, and they disappeared because they stopped growing, or they stopped changing, or they didn't meet change at the time. And one of the things I'm proudest about is how well the firm has um, has grown and changed. Uh, you know, we, every day, it seems like every year we do something different and we continue to do that. We continue to grow. We continue to look at the changing legal market. Uh, when I started practicing law, computers were things that sat in big rooms on college campuses and you needed to learn Fortran or Cobalt to be able to speak to them. Um, if we didn't have computers, you and I wouldn't be doing this today. Um, technology is a huge driver, but Market pressures are drivers. The economy is a driver. We, as you point out, we've lived through depressions. We've lived through wars. We've lived through uh, economic downturns. We've lived through now pandemics. That's a, this is the first one in my time with the firm. And we've done remarkably well. And I think it's because we stick together, we care about each other, and we practice law the right way. Well, Tim, as we'd like to wrap up today's conversation, is there anything else you'd like to leave our audience with? Uh, just that, you know, having been here for 45 years, it is really one of the pleasures of my life to practice law here with the people I've gotten to practice with. Some of them I've mentioned today, others that I haven't had time to mention that uh, taught me to be a lawyer, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to. I came to work at Fenimore Craig originally because the people I met when I interviewed, I thought could teach me to be the kind of lawyer I wanted to be. And it's turned out that way. And I hope we continue to do that for young people. Tim, thanks so much for joining us for today's episode and further sharing the story and the history of Fenimore. Well, thank you, Lindsay. I really enjoyed talking with you today.